Hello. Welcome to the Harassus Extraordinary Meeting, and thank you for joining us on this very relevant topic and panel, Preparing for an Entrepreneurial Gale Post-COVID. My name is Tim Hinchliffe, editor of The Sociable, and I will be moderating today. I'm very pleased to welcome, well, we've got five distinguished gentlemen on this panel. Uh, we've got two that might be having some technical difficulties coming on right now, but uh, hopefully they'll be able to join. And uh, through this discussion, we shall look to chart a course to prepare for what lies ahead. So it is my privilege to introduce David Dorr, co-founder of Coral Global Inc. USA. Tris Dyson, founder and man managing director of Nesta Challenges in the United Kingdom. Dariusz Gibashevich, chief executive officer at Smart Aviation and Training Innovative Solutions, Poland. Uh, and we're waiting on see if they'll join on. Um, Adrian Klichtenberg, founder and chairman of Spark Health in the Netherlands. And Pedro Rocha Vieira, co-founder of Beta E Portugal. Welcome. So preparing, my pleasure, preparing for uh, an entrepreneurial gale post COVID. The description says, the incessant creative destruction of the old was called a gale by economist Joseph Schumpeter. The isolation caused by COVID-19 has thwarted innovators, but they are indestructible. They are creators. How can we ride this gale and innovate for a common good? What are the strategies of entrepreneurs for inspiring in this new age? Uh, a little background on Schumpeter. Schumpeter's Gales of Creative Destruction shows how innovation is creative and beneficial, bringing new industries, wealth, and employment, and at the same time is destructive of some established firms, many products and jobs, and the dreams of failed entrepreneurs. Innovation is essential for competitive survival. Most innovations are incremental improvements, such as ideas used in new models of existing products and services, or adjustments to organizational processes, but most attempts at innovation fail. Organizations rarely innovate alone. They do so in association with others, including their suppliers and customers. Now, thinking about a gale, I imagined a ship facing a gale, a wind, strong wind out on the sea, the ship representing innovation, its drivers, entrepreneurs, captains of industry, and the destination is a, is a common good post-COVID. So, in what ways have entrepreneurs steered this ship through the gale that COVID has wrought, and how can they inspire others to reach that destination for a common good? How have entrepreneurs been able to innovate during the pandemic? Which hurdles have been overcome? What are the strategies moving forward? Uh, and what uh, approaches have been implemented, and what have we learned along the way? Um, so, I think now would be a time to open it up just to um, just to start off with. Oh, she's with you. Just yeah. She's with Can you pop her? Oh, looks like we got Adrian. <laughs> so, Adrian, we're just uh, setting up. Just yourself off camera. Yeah, I'm just sitting up. All righty. So we've got look, all right, we've got another one here. So cool. We keep uh, adding on. So um, yeah, going off of what I just said. Um, so we're looking at uh, what. Our panelists so far, because each of one are entrepreneurs, have uh, unique backgrounds and uh, experiences with with everything that's gone on this year. So, um, who would like to go first in sharing whether it was a challenge you faced this year? Um, in what ways you were able to innovate during the pandemic? What combinations worked? What didn't? Um, strategies for entrepreneurs uh, moving forward, just um, based on uh, experience. Anyone would like to start? Sure, be, I'd be happy to. I, I think one of the, the biggest things that came out of COVID is it removed the stigma about working from home, having distributed teams. Um, for, for our firm, we were fortunate. We were built as a distributed team from the beginning and that allowed us to actually leverage it with everybody not having to travel and being captive in their house. Um, we saw productivity like many other groups around the world. We actually saw productivity just completely go through the roof. And the period turned out to be very productive, uh, productive for our team, for servicing our customers and allowed us to be hands on for a lot of customers that, you know, normally wouldn't have had such access across our entire team. So from that standpoint, I think that one thing that will never change post COVID is that now it's acceptable. I mean, look, we're here in a virtual meeting today 
And, you know, this would have been an in-person conference and, and everybody's hosting virtual meetings. And, and it's, a, it's a big benefit that everybody's accepting that there's a better work-life balance thanks to, uh, thanks to modern technology. So that's at least how it's, it, it's benefited us. Excellent. Yeah. Um, with uh, remote working and virtual conferencing like this, also, I was, I was thinking about other um, norms and practices, not so much to do with innovation, but even just putting on this jacket here. I didn't, I don't know if like, well, in person, you like, I, I could be there. You could smell my cologne. I've got this jacket on, you know, we can eat and have a drink over here. Uh, but yeah, different, but more productive this way. I can see. Um, who wants to go next? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I can go, I can go next. Um, I, I, th I think it's worth saying, um, uh, I, I, I do, I am an entrepreneur. I have a social enterprise uh, background, but the, the thing that I run at the moment is called Nesta Challenges. Um, and essentially we run challenge prize competitions, which is to stimulate and support innovation in and around particular problem areas. Um, so I think, you know, largely I think my insight or, or what I wanted to talk, talk about today is, is less about myself as an entrepreneur, but around some of the experiences we have in supporting, you know, thousands of entrepreneurs around the world that are tackling particular issues, in, including during um, COVID. Um, and I, the kind of the response has been, I mean, we, we, we as a team of, of similar to everybody else, I think have moved online and we've gone digital and we're doing this sort of thing a lot more of. Um, but I think the, there's been an incredible response to some of the social and economic and health problems uh, that are starting to emerge uh, and are going to be uh, impacting us over the next decade. And so we've seen innovators that have both had to stop doing what they're doing for because, it, because it's just been so disruptive. Um, I'm thinking of a neurologist uh, who works on an open banking tool that's working on one of our challenges um, who had to stop developing his open banking application to go and work on the NHS uh, front line. Uh, but more commonly, we've had innovators that have had to pivot uh, or have wanted to pivot because of the enormous set of problems and issues that have arisen. Uh, and I think that speaks to the innovator mindset, the entrepreneurial mindset, which is innovators love problems. Um, and so like, one of our challenges, so the Longitude Prize has got teams around the world that are developing incredible diagnostics uh, specifically to tackle antimicrobial resistance, which in itself is going to kill close to a million people this year and is, and is, is going to be an even bigger problem in, in the future. Um, but many of them, in fact, the majority of them have taken their technologies and their approaches and they've directed it towards rapid diagnostics um, for COVID. Uh, and we've been supporting them to do that, accessing government funding and uh, helping to connect them uh, with the right sort of partners. Uh, and then my team itself has pivoted in that we've recently spun up a challenge. Uh, and this is called the Rapid Recovery Challenge. And this is, again, a response to the, the kind of the enormous disruption that, that COVID has, 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 has wreaked. Um, and looking at the socioeconomic problem. So we're already experiencing huge levels of unemployment. And it's going to get worse. Uh, we're also experiencing people getting into associated problem, people getting into lots of financial debt and financial issues. So we're, the Rapid Recovery Challenge is a response to that, which is to get innovators to help people connect with job opportunities. Because if you think about it, the, the labor market, the way that you search and look for jobs is still hasn't changed for, for decades. It's still very crude uh, and should be much more sophisticated uh, and then the other is around financial resilience. So people getting themselves into, into debt uh, when the enormous potential of digital um, services through fintech and things like open banking mean that we should be able to provide much more um, uh, exciting products and services to people that are uh, otherwise getting into significant uh, issues around debt. So th those are some of the things that we, we've experienced as, a, as, as a my organization. Interesting. So we, I see we've got um, being uh, a focusing on impact, whether it's socioeconomic impact, um, working towards the common good, collaboration, and uh, the ability to pivot. Because um, when something comes at you, are you stable enough? Can you 
deal with this, pivot, and then face these other problems head on. Um, good insights there. Um, so we've got uh, up next um, either Daray, Dariush or, or Adrian. Okay, so let me like some of this for thank you. Actually, I'm going to provide you a surprise for all of us for the success of the house of work, government, and. Dariush, the um, the microphone seems to it it, it has some um, some kind of a, a, a tang, uh, a weird sound to it. Do you? Um, I don't know. Is there another microphone that you can use, or uh, maybe the computer microphone? Right now, it's better. Yeah, I think maybe when it's a little closer, it sounds a little bit clearer. Right now, a bit of an echo, but it might be under. Okay. So I said that. You can no, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the computer microphone. Maybe if you put it, I don't know if you, maybe. Right now? Yeah, it's a little bit better. Oh, it is okay. Okay, so, 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 as I said before, it's like a big surprise for all of us for that there's a state in post of government. And I think right now there is only one way to accept this question that we've got right now and also accept the thing that the world probably will not return back to the situation before the world. So we should start every hour thinking about the step that we take uh, also with this diagnosis. Of course, uh, it's very important what kind of scenarios we will face in the future. Actually, those scenarios are based on the four factors. The first one is how long the uh, COVID and epidemic situation will last. Uh, the second thing, what's going to be the problem last, I mean, what's going to be the level of acceptance for the situation by and, and I heard from the community. Uh, also, we can see there is some global rejection when we talk about and digitalization of the entire life because there's kind of also mistrust. Darius, I I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> My apologies. It, it seems like. Um, it might be that there are got two microphones, like the, the the computer microphone, and before the other one were on at the same time. So I, the, there might be like something going on there. Um, if you want, maybe you can type in in the comment section um, something for right now because I, I'm not able to understand what what you're saying. So you cannot understand me. It, it comes in and out. Oh, it's very um, in the meantime, though, if you would want, if you can put them in the comments, maybe, and then um, we can see them there. And in the meantime, maybe we can go on to uh, Adrian. Okay, go on to Adrian, please. Uh, okay, so I'm. Uh... Uh, myself, I'm a founder of a company at Spark Health, and we have two sides of it. We have a non-profit where we really run very big registries for COVID in India. We have the underlying sources, uh, why certain people will get it and other people not, uh, and support it there. And the other part is really helping smaller companies, startups. Yeah, uh, startups, not really startups, companies that have 10, 20 people, they have an, uh, you know, a product, and make sure that they are uh, successful. And we help them by coaching as well as the distribution. Uh, one of the key elements that we are really working on is working towards, and I think that's a big disruption, uh, working towards a flexible workspace, workforce, sorry, flexible workforce. That really means that you have people remote, you have people, temporary people, you have people that are uh, you know, coming in and out. And we're combining this really with what we call, uh, we believe that COVID is here to stay. Uh, I don't believe that COVID will go away and that it will go back to a normal situation. Uh, we'll have COVID and this will go on because even if you are, if we are successful to get the vaccine, a lot of different things and to get the next virus is just around the corner. Uh, so I'm really not a very big believer that we just can solve this easily. So, uh, in order to be prepared for that, what we're really trying to do in the workforce, uh, uh, that people really get support, uh, for example, if they have COVID or they need to get in quarantine, how we support them that they're not worried yeah, to be either financially 
in trouble, either, you know, uh, get to their families uh, mentally. What does it really mean for me? Yeah, the whole isolation part. So uh, what we're doing at this moment, we are we're running a program where um, we have little uh, bracelets yeah, where we measure the things. And then based on their profile, and at this moment we're using very simple Maya Briggs profile, we try to figure out if the people really are worried, are the people are risk takers, and how we really can help them during the periods that there is COVID to be successful. And we're rolling this out at this moment for hospitals and what we call critical industries like supermarkets. So, uh, so what I believe is that how we work and how the work needs to be integrated with life at home and in the society is fundamentally disrupted by COVID. Yeah? And I think it will continue to do. And we are trying to prepare our companies as well as really creating the software and the mental help yeah, for people to deal with this. So that is <laughs> that is what we're what we're focused on at this moment. Questions? I, it looks like you're frozen, uh, Tim. Oh, no, you're not frozen. You have your uh, microphone off. You're muted. Looks, looks like we lost. Okay. What a few uh, tech hear what you say. Uh, there. Um, um, is, is everyone in a Not, um, that it's somewhat that it's here to stay. So moving forward, uh, it's still going to be thinking in these terms um, of you know of so is, is social distancing. I, I'm, I'm understanding, Adrian. Is are you talking from a standpoint of like of like social distancing? A no, is, I, I, is, I give 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 a good take. Workers in the supermarket. Yeah, there are a lot of young kids filling the. Yeah, <laughs> making sure that there is enough stuff there. There are some people behind the cash registers. There are some people walking around. No, a lot of people coming in. Yeah. So now, this is a place where there's a lot of contact, and it's a potential very dangerous place to get COVID. Yeah, especially if you know when it's there. So how you help those people uh, to be successful? Now, first of all. There is a work problem, yeah? So you really want to make sure that your workforce is flexible and healthy, yeah? So what you want to do is you want to measure them as early as possible, yeah? And see what's happening. And then what you want to do is you want to put them in guarantee, say, hey, you go home, you're not going to work, yeah? But if that's the case, you put a lot of pressure on those people, yeah? Financial pressure, because how do we pay for them? Just you have to really figure out how we do that, right? You know, I'm working in an environment. What will happen with my, you know, with my loved ones yeah, if I have it or I have been in contact with a person at that COVID and you have to really put people in quarantine. So this whole process yeah, needs to be built into your work phase, workforce. Yeah? And you have to really make sure that your workforce understand it yeah, and is mentally prepared to accept that. The same, if, for example, in a hospital. Yeah? Very clearly, yeah? You know, if they have COVID, if they start getting the early signs of COVID, you have to set them home as quickly as possible. That's the only way to really run this correctly. Yeah? So you need to make sure that testing is available, that literature is available, but also you need to make sure is, for example, hey, this is a person that has a personality profile, yeah, that he's willing to take a lot of risk. Wow. Okay. So now I have to really make sure, even if he doesn't feel anything or he's maybe asymptomatic, yeah, yeah. He sits at home, stays in quarantine. Yeah, how do we do this? Yeah, and how we integrate it in the workplace because that's where major contacts are. So that's kind of, I think, you know. So there are two things. One, of course, the disruption is happening, and it is also a little bit the same as uh, David says. Yeah, we get them 
distributed workplace. Yeah? People work offline, people are temporary, people are, you know, you see it happening. There's all different kinds of people coming in and out. And, and yeah. And secondly is then, okay, how you manage the health of this workplace, both in what they call physical, do you have, you know, corona and not, but also mentally. Yeah. The mental health of people in an, you know, environment where you can get corona is tremendous. Yeah. And we have not seen that effect yet, but that effect will be in the next two years. We see the that grow up or have lived through the coronavirus period. Being in quarantine is, is a major problem. Yeah. I see my mom, she's 92. When we started uh, corona, she was still very, you know, very intellectual. She was playing bridge. She couldn't remember. Now, after, you know, almost six months of almost no contacts, yeah, not really measuring, she really has been falling, you know, really behind. Yeah? She starts forgetting things. She's not sure about stuff. She feels, you know, isolated. She has anxieties. And there's nobody that really is, is there. So I think Corona has three problems. First of all, there's a problem that you're really sick. Yeah, and the, the the effects of the sickness are not over. It's not the flu. They can be years and years with you. Yeah, so it's not something that goes over even even if you have not been in the hospital. Second problem is a mental problem. Yeah? So how you deal the ment the mental problem of being isolated, having less contacts. Yeah, and and have to. And the third one is a financial problem. Yeah, because you know from. <laughs> How you pay and, and who's going to pay this and, and how do we do this right? And, you know, so, and all those things I think are, you know, very much linked together and we need to start solving those problems in the workspace. Excellent. Very good points. Um, especially thinking about, um, well, the, using your mother as an example of, of the, uh, the mental, uh, impacts as well, the, the, of what, uh, COVID has brought about. Um, I want to go and look at um, the, the comments from the Darius. Um, so what I can see here, I can't scroll up on the comment for some reason, but the first one I see is um, supply chains are the digitalized chains today. Um, he says different companies with diverse strategies use a variety of digital technologies to improve their competitiveness. Find the solutions which are optimal for you. There's no one model for every business entity. That, that's a good point. Um, select the top and most functional solutions and invest only in them and look for hybrid models of running your business. Um, these are good points. Uh, there were some, you know, uh, like we were saying earlier about pivoting. Um, and uh, so hybrid models, how about that? So is that something that can be applied um, universally? across sectors um, in order to inspire for a greater good. We're, uh, we're, what, what I was going to say, I think, I think what was being described is what, what a lot of people are experiencing, enormous financial and economic disruption, huge challenges in, in the workplace um, in terms of, you know, being able to manage lockdown, not lockdown, um, that may well carry on for a, for a very long time, as I think everybody agrees. Um, and then the, the challenges around mental health and isolation, and uh, th 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 this, is, this is common to everybody around the world. I think for me, what's been quite remarkable is the, the level of innovation that's, that's happened so rapidly. Um, and, it, and I think it's amazing uh, how fast elephants can move when they need to. Uh, and it creates enormous opportunity for innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, who would have thought governments would uh, be channeling so much money into uh, drugs, into diagnostics, into new ways of working. Who would have thought whole companies would be shifting online using tools uh, like we're using now? It, it, it's, it's an amazing time in many ways from a, for people who are inherently uh, interested in, in solving problems. Um, and so it's also a very dis destructive time, potentially, 
Um, but I don't think it necessarily um, leads to the, the creation of, of too many casualties either. Um, I think, you know, there's sectors where you've seen, where we've seen this level of disruption before, which has been really everybody's benefit. Um, and I think, I mean, recent examples have been around in the UK anyway, the introduction of open banking and financial, uh, financial product, new financial products and services, um, where innovators have come in and they've created a huge level of disruption. Um, some of which we were involved through the, through, through a challenge that we ran called the open up challenge around targeting innovation at, at lots of problems that hadn't been properly solved by the incumbents. Um, and some of those fintechs are now some of the leading scale ups in the, in the industry and in the sector. So that, so that, you know, throwing things up in the air creates that type of opportunity, but it hasn't killed off the incumbents. Um, the incumbents themselves have had to innovate and adapt. Um, and they've been challenged by everything else that's going on and they've had to compete and re-examine the services that they then provide to customers, either by copying what fintechs do or in some cases through acquisition. So I think for innovators and entrepreneurs, basically, there's a lot of problems out there. Um, and that's what innovators and entrepreneurs like. And so it, it creates a lot of potential and a potential of opportunity um, and particularly around social goods, because these are inherently um, social and economic problems that we're going to be facing for very many years to come. Tim, if you can hear us, your your mic's on uh, on mute. Looks like he's got a slow feed. Is that what everybody else is seeing? Well, just I'll, I'll add a comment on that. that it, just I completely agree with you. I think one of the other interesting things that's that's highlighted out of this um, this crisis is teaching entrepreneurs to think asymmetrically. Right. A, a pandemic is a very asymmetric proposition. The, the, the risk is highly outscaled, which it's no coincidence that climate change is such a big topic in 2020. Finally. I mean, it's been an ongoing topic for, for decades. But I think we'll look back as 2020 being the demarcation point for really seeing action kick into gear across broad spectrums, which is, is long overdue and, and well needed. And that's exciting. There, there's also this unusual phenomenon for entrepreneurs, our, ourselves included, that through, through the majority of history, there's really only been two types of entrepreneurs. And, and I give an example. You know, you, you move to the suburbs and you don't see a pizza restaurant. Well, everybody likes pizza. You open up a pizzeria. Pretty basic. That's your that's your every, everyday average, you know, entrepreneur. Then you have your innovators, you know, Steve Jobs. You want to put uh, all your music files on a, on an iPod in your pocket. And so they're innovating. But there's a unique proposition that's facing entrepreneurs today that's a, for the first time in that things are moving so quick that today's entrepreneurs have to be creating solutions for problems that don't yet exist. And just giving kind of a funny tongue in cheek example of this uh, drone parking garages. Right. That's not really a problem. But things are advancing so quick that today's entrepreneurs have to think exponentially to jump ahead of that and start solving and working with the complexity of dealing with those solutions, even though those problems haven't yet quite arrived. And that's that to me is is, is personally, I, I think, is just fascinating. And, and so these new mindsets and, and mental models, um, I think those are some of the benefits that are that are coming out of this uh, this pretty disruptive year that we're all experiencing. Yeah, I, 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 that's a good example. There's a, there's a company I know in London who are buying up roof spaces. And this isn't like related to COVID-19, but they've been doing it for the last few years, um, specifically for when drones become a much more commonplace thing in the centre of London. And, 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 and people who own real estate in London have been thinking, well, you know, okay, fine, we, we don't use our rooftops. So they've been buying up huge areas of rooftops and they're betting on the future. And they're betting on a future where they can see drones flying around 
um, uh, in a much more commonplace way. Um, now, the question when that will happen, yeah. uh, surely it will happen. Uh, so I think that I, I would agree with I would agree with some of that. Yeah. Tim, looks like you're back, but still the the mic on uh, on. Yeah. How about now? All right. So um, moving forward, then, what can foster more of this innovation? What is what is needed or what are you, can you continue doing and what can stay, what can go? So we're looking towards more remote working. We're looking towards digitalization. There's some elements of automation. Um, what to do with uh, talent? You know, is, is talent, um, you know, do you, is it better to uh, impart knowledge and wisdom and share it with the community so we can co-create and tackle these things together? Um, should it be in isolated silos? Um, or, or even with, with um, yes, speaking of talent again, um, is it good to um, upskill or give them the freedom to become entrepreneurs? Do we need more entrepreneurs? Is that, is that um, one way to foster uh, more innovation during this time? Or, or Critical thinking. Okay. We need to foster critical thinking in, in, a, in a distracted world where so many young people are growing up with a lot of talents and skills. One of the biggest gaps we see when hiring is it's, it's critical thinking. The ability to go deep and really spend the time and hyper focus on, on stuff is, uh, is something that we need to foster across the board. Yeah, I think another part is really making sure that people have the building blocks to very quickly put things together. So I think the whole open source community and things like that is very important. Uh, you can see the cloud is now a building block. Huh? So we can do things much, much faster. So I think it is like, uh, I call it the infrastructure for entrepreneurship. Huh? So, you know, you need the personal characteristics as critical thinking and things like that, that is encapsulated in a person. And normally that comes from mentors. Yeah, you see people and you, you know, you grow up and, you know, you have a teacher that is your idol and then you pick it up from him. But the other part is so essential is from, you know, how really do we make sure that the building blocks are ready for the entrepreneurs so that they can put things. And that's for me, the key discussion, what we don't have and what a lot of governments are forgetting. They think a building it really is, is from, you know, these are the cloud solutions. These are, you know, and you, you can go on and on and on for every sector. Yeah, you have different ways to really build the building blocks. But they also can be standardizations, but you need to be quick. So you need to build. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I would agree with that as well. Um, I, I think like in terms of fostering innovation, like my, my appeal would be to, to governments and, and policymakers which is that they've suddenly found how useful innovation is uh, and how quickly they need to move. And I think essentially what that means is they need to not lose that um, because they're going to have, uh, on the one hand, they're going to have, we're going to have, they're going to have many more problems which need solving and which need innovation on that, on the one hand. On the other hand, they're going to have less money, comparatively less money because of the levels of debt and the impact on the economy. And so they need to get better at stimulating innovation, both to improve productivity, just generally to improve, you know, uh, economic returns uh, and help our economy. But they also need to get better at finding and identify the innovators and the entrepreneurs and the solutions that can help develop solutions to societal problems that are going to be with us uh, over the next decade. And they're particularly going to affect you know, the lower paid, uh, the young women and so on that are already being the hardest hit. Um, and I think they've got to unlearn what they've done to date, where uh, increasingly funding, but not just funding, other types of support have been directed, I think, too much towards the incumbents. Uh, and then, you know, the UK government or the European government wonder why that doesn't result in the sort of productivity gains uh, that they're looking for, the very modest productivity gain. Um, and that's because they're using old tools for supporting innovation, which is 
grant funding and tax credits and this sort of thing, which are fine, but they are inherently uh, risk adverse and they're about supporting uh, the more established organizations and innovators. And they've got to find ways of finding the most radical breakthroughs, both if they're going to start, start solving some of these problems more effectively and in terms of boosting productivity. Um, and, you know, one method, the method that we would advocate is, is, is challenge prizes, where you set a series of outcomes uh, and you challenge people to solve those outcomes. And then you're agnostic about where uh, the solutions come from. But there, there are others. Um, and I think governments are, have woken up to that. And it's in alignment with mission driven innovation that you see in North America and, and Europe and elsewhere. Um, and it has to be done in tandem with other things as well, which is non-financial. Um, so that could be a much more adaptive and iterative regulatory environment. The, the, the old way of doing regulation, which is set your regulation and then look to adjust it in 10, 15 years, doesn't work for disruptive digital technologies that are, that are rapidly outdoing this type of um, uh, old way of doing things. And so I think the appeal is to policymakers to to reinvent the way that they stimulate and support innovation um, over the next decade. Yeah, definitely agreed with that. Doris, why don't we? We'll uh, I'll read some of your your comments here just for the the group to hear. Since uh, it looks like Tim lost his uh, connectivity here. Um, but Darius was, was sharing, you know, implement the client oriented business policy, not only product oriented policy, a, a, absolutely spot on segmenting your customers, but use their experience depending on the mix of physical and digital elements. Absolutely not using just solely the demographic factors. In addition, test your products and approach customers when the products are good enough. They do not have to be perfect. Do not lose your time. Get the feedback from uh, clients as soon as possible and improve your products. For sure, these types of you know loops to to quickly iterate or or fail fast, as we see, is popular in in, in the valley, um, and then implement the drivers of diversity of thought. Super important. It completely, I think we all agree with you there. Engaging external entities for having cross fertilized ideas, but remembering about the in house innovators. They know better your business and the protection of your intellectual property rights. Yeah, all wonderful, wonderful uh, points that I think, you know, probably resonate with all of us here on, on, online. What, what are yeah, the thoughts maybe, do you have on this, uh, Adrian? Yeah, I, I think there is also one thing I think we should not forget. Um, I think change has also come by really big leaps. And, for example, we now enter the, the realm of quantum computing. Yeah? And I think it comes a little bit out from, yeah, how can you think? How can you imagine things that are not there yet? Yeah. Uh, for example, that we have lots of satellites just going around this earth. What are we going to do with those things? So I, I think it is not. So I think there is an approach what we call, you know, what I was also teaching at Stanford, <laughs> from the customer back, yeah, and and then really run your business. But still, technology I think is a very much a game changer, yeah? Things what we couldn't do before we can do, you know? And think back in history, when we first had the microscope, suddenly a lot of things became... I think you should not underestimate what they call the deep tech part, yeah? And the deep tech part has a lot of dimensions in it, you know? There's an AI dimension, there is a quantum computing dimension. Uh, and, and I think um, that is, I think, where universities still play a major role and think about it, you know, you just have done your PhD, you're, I think, on top of the world in that subject, almost, I want every PhD to really start a company with what they're doing almost to see how far they can get. Absolutely. And I'd add one other thing, because, you know, the, the potential of quantum computers and, and AI, as we know, is it's almost hard to fathom. And in addition to that, one of the wild parts of, of 2020 that I think is a game changer and is not getting enough conversation yet, but I think will accelerate into 2021 is look at the empirical data coming out on UFOs. There is an absolute mountain of information coming out from U.S. Department of Defense, from you know militaries around the world. You're starting to see this open source sharing 
of information with, we don't know what's going on out there. We don't know if that's, you know, technology that perhaps governments have, or if we're starting to finally perhaps make contact. There's a lot of really, really wild stuff that's been happening this year. And as these things accelerate, we are going to have to use just an enormous amount of imagination for what things look like going forward. So all, all good points. And it looks like, let's see, Tim, just a image. Okay. So Tim's saying here, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, he was getting cut out. Final thoughts on how we can ride the gale and innovate for a common good. What are the strategies uh, of entrepreneurs for inspiring this new world and this new age? So why don't we just go around? Trist, why don't you start off and we'll just do a circle. Uh, Darius, why don't you type up for us and I'll read yours and we'll just do a round table and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up at the, uh, the end on, on Tim's uh, behalf. What, what do you think are the, the best strategies for entrepreneurs for inspiring this new age? What's the inspirational method to take it forward? Uh, I mean, know the problem you're, you're trying to solve. Um, we see a lot, a lot of innovators that are developing innovation with some of these exciting technologies that you've been referring to. Uh, I haven't given enough thought to who they're solving the problem for and, and really understanding that it's fairly basic, but I think that's the key. Wonderful. And Adrian, you want to uh, touch on your thoughts on that while, while Darius is, is typing up his? Yeah, I, I think there are two things that is, I think, important. You know, from I've learned most of the things that I know by working with people that are remarkable. Yeah? And uh, I think we should really keep that happening in society. You know, that people can really work with remarkable people together and share their thoughts. So I think that's a very important part. And if you can do that, you know, having for, uh, no, work of, uh, flexible workforces or having X prices where people can, you know, work and they can work with people that inspire them. And, um, the other part, so that's, I think, an important part that we really should try to keep for the social good. And the second thing, what I think is very important is keep, give people a safe environment. Yeah, uh, Think about it. You know, only maybe 5% or 10% of the population, they make enough money to be really safe every day. Yeah, That they don't have to worry exactly what's happening tomorrow. Lots of the people have to worry about tomorrow, 90%. We never can really harvest their potential. Yeah, if we don't make their life also financially safe. And I think we need to start working on those aspects in a much larger kind of, uh, you know, globally. Uh, absolutely. Okay, guys, well, we've got one minute and 40 seconds left. So Darius, as you're typing away on the keyboard, I'll just add my two cents on it. Um, I think inspiring through resilience, you know, reminding, you know, Young folks, older folks, everybody of all ages that, you know, humanity is resilient and that it's one of our best features and that tapping into that is a, is a wonderful way forward. It's how nature works. And um, I, I think that that's a good, you know, template and, and mindset for us to have. And then here we go. Perfect. Darius, right on time. So reading what Darius has to share here, the crisis seems to be a chance uh, in disguise. Listen to your customers and ask them questions. Uh, they answer your drivers, look for world-class talents so you can use their capabilities in the future. Take care of people who work for you. Absolutely. I think that that's a, a, a wonderful way to uh, to bring this to a conclusion. Take take care of those that are around you and work for you. And uh, Tim, I see that you're back online here. So if you have anything that you'd like to conclude with, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. No, as you and Daria said it and everyone else here too, I mean, just what happened here during this this conference here, just with the uh, with me getting cut out and the video going out and things, and you taking over to uh, to help out and, and move things forward. And you know, if one link in the one chink, one link in the chain gets a little chipped, you know, others come in to uh, help bring everything together. Um, man, thank you so much. Uh, I know that uh, there's some technical difficulties here with everyone, and um, oh, I appreciate all that you've done. And uh, uh, ten seconds left, so. Um, Thank you all gentlemen. Thank you everyone else who is watching. And there's a many great programs, many great um, panels going on right now. So um, enjoy. Thank you all. Thank you everyone. Take care. Take care.